Welcome back. We've talked about convex functions. We've talked about convex sets. We're ready to get into the main part of this course, which is the algorithms for solving the main problems we care about. We're going to start by talking about gradient descent and um, giving a motivation for where it comes from. And then we'll see some examples. Again, we're interested in solving the problem minimize f of x subject to x in our constraint set. I won't keep mentioning it, uh, but everything inside is convex. And we're going to focus on, initially, just the objective function. In other words, we're going to imagine that we have no binding constraints. You can imagine that our constraint set is all of Rn. So the problem that we face is that f of x is some function that is difficult for us to minimize, potentially. And so a very simple idea that is present throughout engineering, applied math, and the sciences is whenever something's too hard, why don't we just approximate it with something easy and try to deal with that? And this is really one way to think about gradient descent. What is a way to approximate a function? Well, basically, let's use Taylor approximation. And the, and the simplest Taylor approximation is a first order Taylor approximation. So what we're going to say, in other words, is that f of x, we can approximate it by a linear function. And this linear function is f at, say, some initial point, plus the gradient at that initial point times x minus x0. So the idea is f might be something complicated, but this is certainly simple. Now, what, is this, uh, what does this look like? Let's try to minimize this, uh, this function on the right. Of course, we see we can't quite do this, because if we were to minimize a linear function, we basically would just roll downhill forever. So we don't quite want to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to derive an iterative algorithm where at each step we minimize a linear approximation, but plus an additional term that makes sure we don't roll all the way downhill. This is also important, not just because we don't want to go down to, down to infinity like this, but also, as you, can, as you can see, the farther away we get from an initial point, let's call this x0, you know, right around x0, this is a pretty good approximation. But way down here, not any longer a good approximation of, of our function f. So another reason why we don't want to move too far. So the idea for gradient descent is we start at some point x0. And then at iteration t, let's, let's let x t plus 1 be what minimizes this linear function. So here's a little bit of notation. The argmin, I don't actually care about the value. That would be just the min. The argmin is the argument that minimizes it. In other words, the, minimi the, the, uh, the solution to. So the argument of this linear function, which is, again, just the Taylor series around the previous point, in this case it would be xt, plus the gradient of f of xt times x minus xt. Just to be clear, this minimization is over x. And then plus my term here, that is going to keep me from going too far. So what is this? This is my linear function, and then a quadratic term that penalizes uh, x being very far from xt. Now, this is a very simple quadratic, and therefore we can solve it by our favorite method, basically taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0. Take derivative, in other words, the gradient, set to 0. And what do we get? We get 0 for the first term plus gradient f of xt, that's the, that's the gradient of the second term, plus 1 over eta times x minus xt, set this equal to 0, and I find that xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta times the gradient of f of xt. And this is exactly the gradient descent algorithm. What about this parameter eta here? 
eta is what's called the step size. So you can see that when eta is very, very small, you don't take much of a big step. Going up to the quadratic function here that we've added, when eta is very small, the term, the constant in front of this quadratic becomes very, very large. So it's basically saying find a minimization, but really don't go very far at all. You're, you're, you're much more concerned about this quadratic. When eta is very big, then this value becomes small, and therefore you take a larger step size. And we can see that exactly in the, uh, in the solution right here. So this is the algorithm, gradient descent, and one way to think about where it comes from. Well, let's see this in action for a very simple example that, of course, we know how to solve using other methods. So let's look at this function, f of x equals 3x squared plus 4x minus 2. So of course we can solve this exactly, or directly rather. How would we do that? Just take the derivative, set it equal to 0. Again, I think it's, 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 it should be clear, but we're not interested in solving simple problems like this. This is just to illustrate how gradient descent performs and give us some intuition. So we could solve it by taking the derivative and finding that x, the optimal solution, is equal to minus 4 over 6, which is equal to minus 2 over 3. But let's just apply gradient descent to this problem. And let's keep it pretty general initially. So let's uh, start with, let's initialize at just some x1. And let's take step size eta. We're not going to commit to a step size yet. We'll see what our step size has to be and how things perform for different, how this performs for different step sizes. So we initialize at some x1. This is basically arbitrary. So let's see what x2 is. Again, the gradient descent basic iteration, the update, let me write it in a generic way as x plus, my update if I'm starting from x, is equal to x minus my step size times the gradient of f of x. Specializing to our particular case, this is equal to x minus eta times the gradient here, which is 6x plus 4. So this means that at iteration t plus 1, I have xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta times 6xt minus 4 eta. And I can collect terms and write this as 1 minus 6 eta times xt minus 4 eta. We can iterate. You see we have a recursion here. So let's write what xt is. This is equal to 1 minus 6 eta. And I'm going to plug xt exactly into the gradient descent iteration. So xt is equal to xt minus 1 minus eta times 6 xt minus 1 minus 4 eta. So that's this, that's this first term. And I also have my minus 4 eta from before. What is this equal to? 1 minus 6 eta squared times x t minus 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta times 4 eta minus 4 eta. In order to make this look a little bit more, uh, we're, we're starting to see a pattern, but to make it a little more clear, let me group these terms and add this plus. What's the next application of this recursion going to give? I won't do it out again because you can see the pattern already. It'll be 1 minus 6 eta cubed times xt minus 2 minus, now we're going to have three terms here. The first term is going to be 1 minus 6 eta squared times 4 eta plus 1 minus 6 eta times 4 eta plus 4 eta. So you can see what's going on here. What are we going to have in the end? We're going to have 1 minus 6 eta. If I repeat this for t iterations, I'll be down to x1. And then I'll have here 
this geometric series, 1 minus 6 eta to the t minus 1, plus 1 minus 6 eta to the t minus 2, all the way down to 1, times 4 eta. You can see I've just factored out 4 eta to the right. And this is equal to 1 minus 6 eta to the t times x1 minus, now let's just briefly remember here what is, uh, what is alpha to the t minus 1 plus alpha to the t minus 2 all the way down to 1. If alpha is less than 1, and that's going to come into how we select our step size, but we'll get to that in a second. If alpha is less than 1, then we know that this is equal to 1 minus alpha to the t over 1 minus alpha. So we can apply this formula directly to what we have, to what we have here. So we have 1. Let me switch my colors back. We've got 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta to the t divided by 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta. So let's see what this, uh, let's see what this gives us when we, when we simplify things a little bit. Let's copy down what we have. So we found that xt plus 1 is equal to 1 minus 6 eta to the t times x1. minus 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta to the t over 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta. All of this times 4 eta. So of course we're going to want, the first thing that we can see is that we actually need 1 minus 6 eta, an absolute value, to be less than 1. Why is that? Well, if we didn't have less than 1, then we see this term 1 minus 6 eta to the t, that would be, that would be growing exponentially. So we need to have this. And as long as we have that, then every term that looks like 1 minus 6 eta to the t is actually going to go to 0 as t grows. And it's going to go to 0 very fast. Let's simplify this, uh, this right-hand side a little bit more. So we've got 1 minus 6 eta to the t times x1. This is my dependence on my initial position. Minus another negative. So that means minus minus is a plus. 1 minus 6 eta to the t over the denominator, which is 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta, or just 6 eta times 4 eta. And then I have the only term left that does not have a 1 minus 6 eta raised to the t. And what is that term? This is my minus 1. This is this term. That's this term right here. Minus 1 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, I have 1 minus 1 minus 6 eta, or just positive 6 eta, times my 4 eta. Let's look at this term again. What does this equal? Without the minus sign, this is just 2 over 3. So this is equal to factoring out my 1 minus 6 eta to the t. I have 1 minus 6 eta to the t. x1 plus 2 over 3 minus 2 thirds. So what do we observe? What does this converge to? This converges to minus 2 over 3 as t grows. And remember that minus 2 over 3 was our solution. So in other words, xt converges to minus 2 thirds, and it does so very quickly. It does so at, sometimes you might hear this called a geometric rate. In optimization, it's called a linear rate. We call this type of convergence 
that converges, we say that it converges linearly. Okay, so this iteration recovers our solution. And again, we were able to just solve this directly with one step by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. But this tells us something about gradient descent. It tells us that it recovers a solution and it does so quickly. Moreover, we see that we very, very quickly get rid of our dependence on our initial guess, x1. That's why we could say that it's not so important. So let's label this our first good news of the day. Basically, gradient descent for this function that we chose converges very quickly. Just to be a little bit more specific about what very quickly means and what linearly means, we can ask how much error do we have after some number of steps? And the answer comes exactly by looking at what this, uh, comes exactly by looking at this term here. We can think of that as being our error for any term since we know that the solution we want is minus two thirds. So the error goes down with one minus six eta to the t. And we said one minus six eta, and this is fast when, say, eta is less than one over six. Okay, so, so far so good. That seems quite promising. Let's uh, see what we learned here. So we needed to take step size small enough so that one minus six eta is less than one in absolute value. Convergence rate, we said was linear. Again, another way you can think about this is that the error that you have is going to scale something like some value to the minus number of steps. I should put a constant here. I don't so much care. Of course, we can compute exactly what little c is, but the point is that this is how that we're, that we're going down at this, at this rate, which is called linear convergence. And it's also important to see that at every iteration, we get better and better and better. So I'll leave this as an exercise for you. It's just a simple computation. Check that f of xt plus 1 is less than f of xt. That makes sense. We're following the gradient down. We're not taking it too big of a step size, so we should be improving at every time. So in fact, this, equality, this inequality is strict unless we're at the optimal solution. So this is basically our summary of what we've seen so far. Of course, our function had some special properties. And this is exactly what we're going to use this example for. We're going to use it to tease out what we, what we need. So let's see uh, two other examples, and in particular, cases where we don't have this differentiability. So let's look at another very simple example. f of x is equal to absolute value of x. So this is, a, this, is this function. And let's try to do the same thing that we did before. Start somewhere and take a number of step sizes. Uh, sorry, take a, and, and then do gradient descent. Um, but, uh, but with a fixed step size, which is just like what we did before. So we start at x1. Note that we can't do gradient descent. We have to do subgradient descent because this point here is not differentiable. But of course, everywhere except for the point x equals 0, we have a gradient. So here, the derivative is minus 1. Here, the, deri here the derivative is minus 1 to the, to the here we have a derivative which is equal to plus 1, which makes sense. This tells us that xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus a step size times, I'm going to write this generically, even though we do have a derivative everywhere except the, uh, the origin. So I'll just get us used to thinking about subgradients and the subdifferential. So this says that if xt is less than 0, then xt plus 1 is equal to xt plus eta. If xt is greater than 0, then xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta. So we observe two things. First, 
we see that our dependence on the initial point is actually not going to go down quite as fast. Every step moves us closer by eta when we're far away. So if we start out 100 eta steps away, it's going to take us 100 time steps to get into the vicinity of the origin. 1,000 eta steps away, it'll take us 1,000 steps to get into the origin. Look back to the previous slide and note that that's not at all the case for gradient descent for our quadratic function. The second thing we should observe, observe is what happens when we get close. When xt is less than eta, what happens? We're like a golfer who keeps overshooting. So we're approaching, and then at some point, we're just going to iterate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like this. We'll keep overshooting. So two differences. Still, we're getting close to the optimal solution, but we need to take eta very, very small. If we take a smaller step size, we'll get, we'll get down to here, closer and closer. But the smaller eta is, the longer it will take us to get into a neighborhood of the origin when we're starting from very far away. So another, uh, another example that we need to look at is a function of two variables, f1, x1, x2 equals 10 times the absolute value of x1 plus the absolute value of x2. What do the level sets of this look like? Well, it will be a diamond shape that's, I'm probably not drawing this to scale, that's about 10 times, exactly 10 times more stretched out in the x2 direction than the x1 direction. So I'm drawing the level sets. So here is an exercise for you to get used to thinking about what a subdifferential is. Compute the subdifferential at the point 0 minus 3. So let's call this point 0 minus 3. Compute the subdifferential there. And another exercise is show that there is a subgradient in this subdifferential such that no matter how small you choose your step size, f of x minus eta times that subdifferential you're going to find is actually strictly greater than f of x. Or x, again, is, uh, is this point, 0 minus 3. Okay, so the important part, the important thing that we learned here is that unlike what we saw for gradient descent, subgradient descent does not actually have to be a descent algorithm. That sometimes it could actually make your function bigger. And this is why I keep writing subgradient method and gradient descent. Sometimes I'll slip and call it subgradient descent, but it really, we really shouldn't call it a descent algorithm because it's not improving it at every, at every step. This is the example I wanted to show you. Okay, so this is basically our summary of what, of what we've seen today. Gradient descent for a function like 3x squared plus, uh, plus 4x minus 2 is a descent algorithm. It improves strictly at every iteration until we get to the optimal solution. We also saw that gradient descent takes a step size that's unrelated to the error we want. It has what's called the self-tuning property. So let me be clear about this because this is, this is very important. We saw that for our function that was not smooth, we would go from here to here and then basically stop. And if we wanted to have better error, so for f of x equals absolute value of x, for small error, we need our step size to scale down 
with epsilon, which is not great for us because if you want a very small error, you need to take a very small step size, which is really going to slow you down when you start from far away. But for our function, f of x is equal to 3x squared plus 4x minus 2, we got to arbitrarily small error. Remember our expression for the error scaled like 1 minus 6 eta to the t. And we took eta to be some fixed number that did not depend on the error, say 1 over 6 we saw was, uh, was enough. The other important thing is to look at how big are the increments xt plus 1 minus xt. How far, what kind of leaps are we making? Okay. Again, for f of x is equal to absolute value of x, this always had the same answer. We always improved by eta. Eta, eta is how, is how far we moved. But for f of x equals 3x squared plus 4x minus 2, what, would it, what did our update look like? Again, xt plus 1 was equal to xt minus 6 times xt plus 4. Whoops, and my eta here. And note that when we were very far from 2 thirds, when you're, when you're very far, this is very big. So when you're far from the solution, you take bigger steps. You make faster improvement. So these are the two properties that allowed us to see such a radical difference between minimizing this polynomial with gradient descent versus minimizing this equally simple function with gradient descent. We're going to pick this up next time and see specifically where these properties, uh, how these properties, properties generalize.